Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Richard Gerson. I direct the Center for 21st Century Studies, and we are uh, sponsoring this event uh, in conjunction with the uh, Digital Culture Collaboratory, aka Serious Play. And um, we've been sponsoring them for the past couple of years, and they're doing really exciting work up at the Center. Um, and you should follow their Twitch channel if you don't already. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Thomas Malaby in just a second, who will introduce Teal Taylor. But a couple of things. Uh, first, just to remind you that after the talk, we'll have a reception up on the ninth floor. And I think it's still going to be light by 5 o'clock. And so the view itself is, is worth it. Um, but the conviviality and refreshments uh, add to the pleasure. So please feel free to join us afterwards. Um, the other thing I want to do is um, something that we try to do uh, for all of our events, which is to acknowledge uh, the indigenous peoples whose land that we are on. So we acknowledge in Milwaukee that we're on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We are grateful to live and work alongside the human and non-human inhabitants of this place. So, thank you. Um, so now I'll introduce Thomas Malby, who's one of the co-directors of the uh, Serious Play. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming today uh, on behalf of the Serious Play or Digital Cultures Collaboratory, uh, including my co-conspirator, Stuart Maltrip, uh, over there. I want to thank the Center for 21st Century Studies for its support of our work, especially for making possible this visit uh, by one of the most distinguished researchers of games, technology, and human experience. T.L. Taylor is Professor of Comparative Media Studies and co-founder and director of Research for Any Key, an organization dedicated to supporting and developing fair and inclusive esports. Her three monographs, Play Between Worlds, Raising the Stakes, and Watch Me Play, each explore with remarkable depth and finesse the MMO EverQuest, the rise of esports, and live streaming, respectively. I have known T.L. for quite a long time, actually. Uh, 20 years ago, just after finishing my PhD, I began teaching in Harvard's social studies program, and that happened to be TL's last year. We kind of glancingly passed. Uh, I, having worked by comparison rather conventionally, anthropologically, on gambling in Crete, uh, had some knowledge of this person looking at online spaces, avatars, embodiment, and virtual worlds. Uh, ever since then, I've continued to have a similar feeling, and I don't think I'm alone. Uh, researchers in this area. That is, when it comes to asking the next questions about technology and human experience, TL always seems to be ahead of us. Now, for scholars inspired by things as self-evidently important and fascinating as the rise of, let's just say, the internet and everything that has trailed along with it, perhaps the most strident temptations are, on one hand, the call to treat the new phenomenon that has captured one's interest with an enthusiastic exceptionalism, joining a chorus trumpeting its novelty, or, on the other, the seductive lure of finding in this new domain only the verification of some structure, whether familiar or newly invented, that magically makes it all sensible, familiar, and domesticated. TL has given into neither of these temptations. In what may be a reckless disregard for the parochial claims of ownership by anthropology of the genre of ethnography, I consider TL our foremost ethnographer of our digitally mediated experience. And the primary reason for this has been her commitment to approaching each topic that interests her with a diligent and extremely keen curiosity, neither reifying nor reducing, as so many do in a rush to force the messiness of social life to flee the scene. As a result, we have the great benefit of glimpsing, through titles such as Watch Me Play, the open-ended constitution of an unquestionably substantial cultural phenomenon, in this case live streaming, as it is happening. The conceptual heavy lifting required to handle such complex material itself in the process of becoming is inherent in the historical quality of her treatment of it, and this bodes well for how valuable these works have been and will continue to be for all of us going forward. 
So without more delay, please join me in welcoming Professor T.L. Taylor. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, and just really the kind hospitality and conversation so far has been so lovely. So thanks. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the reception after and getting to chat with more of you and learn more about what you're all doing as well. So um, I will ask you to forgive me. I'm going to read. I've, I've, over the years, gotten worse at improvising. So I'm going to read. But hopefully, it'll still be interesting. And I have a lot of good pictures to show you. So. So today I'm going to talk a bit about my sli a slice from my current book on live streaming, Watch Me Play. Um, and these are uh, the books that Thomas mentioned. Um, Watch Me Play, you can actually get a free PDF copy of it. I had negotiated with Princeton a free PDF. So if you go to watchmeplay.cc, you can pull it. Um, there's some errant code on the page. Ignore that. Scroll down and get a free copy. Don't buy it. Anyway. so. <laughs> um, the book, the book itself focuses on a range of topics across, a ver, across the variety in esports domain. It looks at labor, forms of production, and systems of regulation. It covers work I undertook from about 2012 to 2015, really a very early period of Twitch, um, during really the first period of its pla the platform's life. And it is history at this point. So many of the folks here, your grad students and others, are doing work on the current iteration. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of background on why I started this project and how it evolved. So I began looking at Twitch be, j because just as I was finishing my last book on eSports, e live streaming really suddenly broke through. It could be hard to believe now, but eSports used to be in a very precarious spot back then, having recently gone through a tremendous bubble that was a huge blow to North American competitive gaming in particular. So in May 2012, I was sitting on my sofa while I was still living in Sweden, browsing the internet, when I stumbled on a website showing a live feed of a StarCraft II computer game tournament taking place in Paris. <clears throat> in esports competitions, as some of you may know, professional players compete in a formal tournament setting for money. Given my prior research, I was familiar with game broadcasting attempts over the years, but this produ production particularly caught my eye. The event was taking place at the beautiful La Grand Rex Concert Hall, as pictured here. And camera shots of an energetic, cheering audience of over 2,000 people were interspersed with live feeds of the game competition itself. The strange world of StarCraft, populated and fought over by human Terrans, otherworldly Protoss, and creepy insectoid Zergs, shared screen time with the faces of the players, commentators, commentators and importantly, audience that filled that large theater. Yet there was also another set of spectators, one solely participating online. Along with thousands of others around the world, I was watching this match in real time over the internet. On our screens, right alongside the video piping out from Paris, a chat stream, and in fact an old school for maybe some of the old, us old timers in the audience, an old school IRC chat channel flowed by, with hundreds of people talking to each other about the event and sharing through text and emoticons. Now, as someone who has studied not only gaming, but has roots in internet studies more broadly, virtual environments, synchronous computer-mediated communication, as we used to call it, my research ears really perked up. What caught my attention was not only the spectatorship, it was also the forms of communication and presence among broadcasters and audience, both on-site and at the, on -site at the venue and distributed throughout the network. I was intrigued by the experience as a media event. This show was being broadcast to a huge global audience, and as I came to learn over the course of that night, was being talked about in a variety of other online spaces, such as Twitter. I had my television on in the background, as I often do and did, uh, but soon turned that volume down. The game channel being broadcast on my laptop came to capture my full attention. And it was pretty immediately clear to me that I needed to explore that space more. In fact, I thought I would just write an article to bring the story up to date. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> um, so that feeling, though, that I was not watching alone, but instead alongside thousands of others in real time was powerful. And for me, it was a familiar resonant experience. I've actually long loved television, especially live content. And even as a kid, I felt its pull. I remember getting a small black and white television in my bedroom as a preteen and staying up late to watch Saturday Night Live and tap into an adult world I didn't have access to otherwise. Breaking news frequently had the effect of helping me feel an immediacy of connection with the larger world. 
My father always either had on the evening news or sports broadcast, and our family typically had the TV on from late afternoon to bedtime. Live show, beyond live shows, we constantly had on cartoons, sitcoms, and procedurals, and rather than going to the theater, mostly watched movies through it. The TV was an object, in our, was an object our family shared and gathered around. We kept it on constantly. <laughs> Much like Ron Limbo's account of continuous television use, which includes his own personal reflections on how television was situated in his own working class home, my personal and social experience of television has ranged from the mundane to the meaningful. Sometimes it held my full attention, while at other moments it was simply background noise, offering a welcome ambient presence. Television was not only a presence in my family's life, it connected me to the outside world, entertained and informed me, offered material for conversations with others, and gave me broader cultural waypoints. This relationship with television is not, of course, unique to me. Television scholars over the years have documented the profound role it can have in our lives, from politics, ideology, and myth-making to socialization, structuring our domestic lives and, keeping, and mundanely keeping us company. Unlike some, I never undertook that object of my affection and attention as a site of research. It really simply just was a part of my life. But that night, watching that live stream and the audience engaged alongside me, I really paused. Though I've remained a television viewer my entire life, like many, I also came to spend a lot of time online and in gaming spaces. This broadcast seemed to weave together all these threads at once. It was an interesting collision of what I call the televisual versus the television as a box. Computer games, the internet, and computer-mediated communication. Game live streaming is an excellent example of the ways multiple cultural trajectories collide and iterate. It evokes structures and modalities associated with television, but it also fits within a broader culture of gaming and spectatorship, user-generated content, and, tele and telecommunications. It's an emerging form of what I call networked broadcasting, which again, for those of us who are old enough, may remember the trope of network broadcasting. This is entertainment that is typically rooted around traditional media production and distribution outlets, tapping into gaming fandom and the pleasures of spectatorship, harnessing the evocative power of otherwise mundane webcams, and piggybacking on as well as creating net culture. To some, it may seem like game live streaming came out of left field, but it is, however, tied to a longer historical trajectory of television and internet broadcasting, something I spend more time talking about in the book. Yet it's simultaneously deeply, deeply rooted in our current contemporary moment, which is filled with online media services, maker DIY mo movements, online life, and creative cultural production from all sectors of society. Its vibrancy is actually as a live media product both like TV and yet very much something else. So Twitch, as a broadcast platform, which is the site that I primarily focus my study around, um, ded was dedicated to gaming, which spun off from the social cam site uh, Justin TV in June 2011. And it has, in a handful of years, dramatically reshaped the landscape. Um, last I checked, the site was boasting something like 2.2 million plus unique uh, broadcasters per month with 27,000 members in the Twitch Partner Program, 150,000 creators in the affiliates. I think those numbers are all a bit higher now. All these are content producers that receive revenue for their streams, and about 15 million in daily active users. Can I just say to you, I'm giving you these stats. Take them as a caveat. I mean, we get stats from companies. We always have to, I don't know, put a little asterisk next to them. But you get some sense of scope, I think, with them. Um, and it hosts a wide variety of games from various genres, as well as other things. As I began spending more time on the site, that initial interest of eSports began to grow and morph. I realized there was a much big, bigger project lurking. The growth of game live streaming wasn't simply a story about eSports, but also about larger changes in game culture and sharing your play. While the competitive gaming activity on Twitch is tremendous, and there's a chapter in the book on eSports in particular, it's not just eSports that's finding a home on game live streaming. The medium has offered players of all kinds an opportunity to build audiences interested in observing, commentating, and playing alongside others. And I have to, of course, shout out to your own crew here that runs a Twitch stream, the Serious Play Group, which is doing a lot of this work themselves. So live streaming was allowing gamers of all kinds to, to transform their private play into public entertainment. 
While sites like YouTube have long tapped into this desire with the ability to distribute game videos, live streaming up the ante by offering broadcasters the opportunity to interact with their audiences in real time through that synchronous chat window. Audiences and the real time interactions with broadcasters were themselves becoming integrated into the show. And game live streaming has now become a new form of broadcast. Non esports broadcasters, typically, typically called variety streamers due to the range of titles they play, and that could be new AAA releases or old Nintendo games or niche indie games, are actually a really important part of the platform. And while digital titles have retained the lion's share of content on Twitch, over just a few years, channels have also sprung up covering other areas. So you have active card gamers, old school tabletop role playing, and also the sharing of creative work, you know, cosplay production, cooking, knitting. <laughs> um, all of these things are also now present on, on, the, on the platform as well. I think it's actually an interesting twist back to the Justin TV roots of the platform. Um, where there's now also an in real life category where people are broadcasting just their everyday lives. So what might, might at first glance seem like, simply seem like a platform to stream digital gaming has quickly expanded to accommodate people who want to produce a range of creative content for others. And I often say Twitch really excels and focuses on people sharing practice and process. Some of these broadcasts have small audiences of friends and family who watch. Um, in fact, that's the majority. You know, you're streaming to zero, one, two, three, four people. Um, others draw, in, especially in the case of esports, thousands or millions over the course of a weekend event. Across the platform, participants are creating new entertainment products that mix together gameplay, humor, commentary, real-time interaction with fans and audiences. As with esports broadcasters, some variety streamers are working hard to convert their playtime to a professional job through advertising, sponsorships, donations, and other forms of monetization. But amid all that innovation and experimentation lurk, I argue, a number of critical issues. And there, there's a range of things I discuss in the book, everything from how people are navigating public and private boundary life to harassment and the pernicious kind of exclusion of people from the platform. One I want to talk about today in particular, though, is how decisions on how the platforms and technologies will work and how the ideas about network play and audiences are spinning up into considerations of the future of media and intellectual property in particular. So it's all too easy when we begin to talking about digital games and computational objects in general to center them in the frame and forget the human action and culture present in molding and shaping how things are actually used. But the truth of the matter is that our current state is one in which human action, be it individual or collective, is in a constant dance with computation, this circuit of action. So in the remainder of my talk, I want to use, very, uh, use variety streaming as a way to talk about a new form of play and work in particular arising in the space. I want to detail out a number of layers at work in these productions to highlight how they are not, how the broadcasters are not simply taking games off the shelf and just playing them, but doing something fundamentally transformative with and through their engagement. <clears throat> so while the game itself, so I'm going to show you now a number of screenshots. And it's a little bit hard to see, perhaps, but I've, I've put some yellow borders around elements to draw your attention to them. While the game itself makes up a portion of the viewer's screen, accomplished streamers often use complex, what I call sets, that involve additional audio, graphical overlays, green screening, cameras, triggered events, chatbots, custom chat emoticons specific to the channel, and a customized channel page. It's worth noting that many of these com components are produced not just by the live streamers themselves, but also through third-party graphics designers or programmer programmers who are themselves seeking to find a professional place in this new media sphere. The set of any given live stream is often constructed through the labor of a number of people, at times distributed globally. Successful live streamers don't just silently broadcast their gameplay. Instead, they tend to mix together what we often call a think aloud method in usability studies. Um, where the speaker speaks aloud their thought processes as they interact with the system and makes external that which would normally be in their own head. And that's actually a real skill. Not everybody can do that easily or right out of the gate. 
This is typically accompanied by humor, frustration, and suspense. Streamers talk about this as trying to be engaging or entertaining. They frequently use physical expressions and gestures, at times theatrically accentuated, held for effect to punctuate their communication. This is very embodied performance. Esports broadcasters tend to stand as an exception to this, where they, the, the focus is on virtuoso play and not performance in the same way. Um, but nonetheless, this issue of the performative aspects of streams are really important. While a portion of the commentating that live streamers do is rooted in their moment-to-moment -moment actions, analysis is also an important component of the work of play, reflecting on mechanics, game design, gameplay, feel, and other aspects of the game itself can form a pow powerful part of the value of a stream. Astute streamers not only provide viewers with an entertaining performance of play, but as act as expert evaluators of systems too, conveying to an audience an independent analysis of the game as object. This is sometimes why streamers are thought of as cultural intermediaries. I have some pauses about that at times, but it's, it's one of the aspects that sometimes comes into play. Live streaming performance is also deeply interwoven with audience and community engagement. This is actually one of my favorite moments ever watching a live stream. Um, this broadcaster is playing uh, Walking Dead. And I don't know if you can read any of the text in the chat, but that she would get to key decision points. And then the audience would prompt or suggest things. And when really bad things happened, the audience was like up in arms over it. It was just this really wonderful circuit of interaction. So core uh, to this is this ongoing chat that takes place alongside and within the visual broadcast of the gamer and streamer. In 2016, Twitch reported that 14.2 billion lines of chat flowed through the system. Chat is really a significant part of this platform. Viewers of the channel can not only talk to each other uh, through the chat, but the streamer as well. Broadcasters typically use audio to reply and engage with their audience. Accomplished streamers become adept at following that online conversation, keeping an eye on the chat window, talking to and engaging with their viewers, all while playing the game. And in fact, when you visit the homes of streamers, it's not unusual to see multiple monitors so they can be kind of watching the game in one and fielding chat in the other one. In many instances, the audience becomes enlisted in the gameplay itself by giving choices on in input on choices that's going to happen in the game. These moments, especially in tense game scenarios, are particularly entertaining and regularly generate high audience engagement. A big component to this layer are the interrelations between audience and broadcaster, where connection and affective labor play a significant role. Mixed in with promotional stuff is language about support, dreams, community, love, passion. It's a very personal modality often, one where the entertainer is seen as a kind of friend at times. This kind of social and relational work is not unlike what I think Nancy Baim describes in her recent book on the uh, work musicians are having to do in the face of changing economic and media sphere um, in terms of creating connective labor through social media. This is a shot of somebody's broadcasting space. Uh, posted on Twitter. So. <laughs> So while it's, easy to forget, uh, while it's easy to forget about infrastructures when talking about internet platforms, it's crucial for understanding the complexity of work in live streaming. Beyond the technical components provided by Twitch, such as video codecs, storage, servers, transmission nodes, at the individual streamer level, a range of material and digital components make productions possible. This includes computers, AV hardware, including mixing boards, furniture and lighting. We were just upstairs visiting the broadcasting space here. and You could see the sound panels that had been put on the wall and the multiple mics. Um, at a software level, it involves everything from graphics and AV processing apps to bot and notification trigger systems to network functionality. Many people I interviewed talked about experimenting with and piecing together systems. When looking at support communities for streamers such as the Twitch subreddit, you'll often find them analyzing AV setups, preferred devices, discussions of many behind the scenes details to facilitate broadcast. The level of technicity, what Dovey and Kennedy describe as quote, particular kinds of attitudes, aptitudes, and skill with technology involving, involved in making these more complex streams is key and typically involves a tremendous amount of self-taught and community-taught, community-based learning. And a final layer, 
the economic and commercial frameworks. The financial structures at work in accomplished live streams are also important to consider. Twitch offers select broadcasters the opportunity to monetize streams in several ways, including channel subscriptions in which they get a cut, revenue from ad and game sales, the money from the platform's internal bits donation system, and also third-party donation systems. There's also sponsorship deals, Amazon affiliate links, and so on. So live streaming is offering a new group of folks well beyond pro players, a real twist on the notion of networked play and networked broadcast. These are everyday players imagining the potential to transform their private play into something for a broader public. Live streaming becomes an extension and perhaps redefinition of sofa space and co-located play. Part of the work all of them are doing right now is developing a genre and a fairly fast moving genre. Much of the kind of activity I've described so far has historically been framed as user generated content and has been tied up with notions of non-commercial fandom. This is from, if you, I don't know if you know the Organization for Transformative Works, they have a fantastic journal also. Um, but this, is tip, this framework is typically one where creative action gets positioned as primarily an action of love. That intervention over the last decade has been incredibly important in helping people understand rights they have with things like fair use, for example. And I'm incredibly grateful to the work that Transformative Works has done over the years, this organization. But I think it is perhaps sidestepped some broader critical conversations about what it means for, as Rosemary Coombs puts it, the cultural life of intellectual properties, and ones we might all actually have some right to. While much of what has been written around UGC and gaming has focused on its non-commercial side, over and over again, the live streamers I spoke with had woven together their creative and commercial aspirations. They often felt themselves bumping up against legal structures and understandings of game, understandings of game artifacts as narrowly construed intellectual properties in which game companies are the sole authors and owners. Far too often, live streamers are positioned as people simply using into the intellectual property of others, typically major corporations. The framing generally suggests that it's the generosity of the game publishers that underpins it all, and making money threatens that goodwill. On many UGC platforms, especially those that interweave original creative productions with existing intellectual property, skirmishes continue to break out over ownership and regulation. The governance and management of these spaces as subcultures within a platform hosting dynamic communities of practice continues to pose vexing problems. As is the case with a variety of internet and gaming communities, the tremendous creative energy driving innovation and new forms of culture is frequently in tension with existing legal and social frameworks that struggle to manage it. Gamers push and innovate on, on playing fields publishers claim to fully and solely own. Though live streaming is transforming media production, distribution, and everyday practices, it continues to exist within legal, legal and governance frameworks that are often, I argue, deeply out of step with where the culture is headed. In turn, it gives us a fascinating peek into when network and media culture collide with contemporary digital play, as well as the futures of online producers and audiences. We're seeing the rise of a new form of network broadcasting, one tied up with aspirations to transform otherwise private play into public paid entertainment. This is a shot from uh, TwitchCon where I did a lot of field work over the years. And fans lining up to meet and get signatures and autographs and swag from their favorite broadcasters. In particular, the central trope of non-commercialism doesn't parse well to the dynamic of shifting private pleasures entering a public sphere, one often built very fundamentally on commercialization and professional aspirations. The desire to monetize their gaming that we see, some live streamer, see from some live streamers upturns, I think, the classic UGC conversation where people are imagined to simply be fairly compliant community members engaged in passionate but non-commercial fandom. It's also a model that doesn't fully work for play, which I want to argue is always something more than derivative and potentially infringing use of a software game system. I want to ask, how does the conversation shift if we start acknowledging that play is transformative? 
that meaningful work can be found in ludic spaces, that play exceeds structure and the bounds of software, that perhaps we need more progressive models of intellectual property and perhaps social theory when it comes to these systems that foreground co-creativity. I'm playing with the notion of transformation here, one evoking a more formal legal framing that asks, has the original work been transformed by adding new expression or meaning? And was, the va was value added by creating new information, new aesthetics, new insights, and understandings? But, I, but I'm also wanting to waypoint back to arguments that games are never simply taken as given artifacts, but exist in cultures and contexts where unexpected meanings and practices emerge. In a moment where I think our field of game studies almost fetishizes games as procedural systems, it's important to remember that they are actually complex artifacts that involve circuits of human and non-human action. They are co-created processes, and often play in practice exceeds the given bounds. This sense that a person's unique engagement with a system, the particular circuit between them and a game, is central to broadcasting and animates many of the conversations I find myself, I've found myself in with live streamers over the years. There's typically a strong sense of the performative nature of gameplay, that the game provides a field on which and through individual play unfolds. The performative aspect and ownership of this formulation were clearly articulated by one streamer I interviewed when he sought to find a good analogy to explain to me how he thought about his work. He tapped into the key co-creative nature of gaming when he likened his work live streaming to that of a comedian or a musician who, while using a club's venue, still creates something that is theirs, even though they are using that space. He said, the person who's up there performing, that's their act, that's theirs. So when I'm playing a game and I'm sitting there, I'm on stream, everything. And what is mine is anything, any content I create whenever I turn on my stream. That's my content. That is me. This is mine. Another developed this notion further when they said, so when you stream and you add any elements of customization beyond the game itself, when you start creating your own content, when you start adding humor, when you start doing different things, I think it takes it to a new level that is outside of the black and white of saying it's owned by the game creator. It becomes something of your own, and it's part of the subculture of the internet as well. And this taps into a much larger conceptual intervention, which is that play is always an assemblage. It's made up of actors, processes, artifacts, meanings, policies, and practices that are never contained by a single piece of software. And I want to pause quickly on this for a moment. Contemporary game studies has evidenced this theme for at least the last 15, perhaps now 20 years. Work of critical and feminist scholars like Helen Kennedy, Mia Consalvo, Sal Humphreys, Hector Postigo, John Banks, Adrian Shaw, Kishona Gray, and many others have provided tremendous insight into the cultural and sociological aspects of digital gaming. And if you lean on the work of amazing anthropologists like Linda Hughes, who studied play quite a while ago, we're talking evidence of this for decades. In my own work over the years, I've seen the transformative properties of play from MMOs to esports, whether it's modding, innovative social organization, or the way third parties radically reshape a space. Transformation is a key red thread woven through the study of digital play. The live streamers I spoke with consistently drew out how their productions are transformative and that their work produced new forms of expression, aesthetics, and cultural products. This language of assemblage can be extended into understanding various forms of control and governance happening in live streaming, something I call the regulation assemblage. It can sometimes at first glance seem as if streaming is a fully open, participatory free-for-all. While there are moments that such a description rings true, um, and especially in the early days that was the case, there's actually a pretty complex set of regulations shaping things, from informal social mechanisms to policies and law. And in the book, I detail out those vertices. In the remainder of the talk, I want to focus back on the notion of transformative work within the intellectual property frame in particular. 
There remain foundational issues around intellectual property that in our current DMCA climate leave the work of live streamers precarious. It's indeed already precarious labor generally. Most publishers have increasingly extensive terms of use for video that regulates content and monetization. Innovations like Spectate Faker, which auto-streamed a pro player's gaming using the functionality built into League of Legends without that player, their team, or Riot's permission, ended up posing fascinating challenges to ideas about who has the right to distribute broadcast. Who exactly owns all that gameplay? Over and over again, the assertion is not the gamers themselves. As we know, IP regulation is increasingly embodied via technology where the use of software and computational techniques to enact DMCA provisions remains a constant tension point. This had tremendous impact on YouTube, and we've seen some early moments of this hitting live streams, such as when Michelle Obama's DNC speech or the Hugo Awards were wrongly flagged as infringing <coughs> and shut down, or the various audio, 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 audio muting cases that have happened on Twitch. Automated systems to catch infringement are not able to capture the nuance of determination of fair use or transformative works, much less co-creativity. A large part of what broadcasters themselves are contending with is that, as one expressed it, technology moves at a million miles an hour and laws move in the opposite direction. <laughs> and when technologies come to embody law, it's even lousier, as you can imagine. What we have right now then are creative cultural producers, live streamers, doing tremendous work to transform their private play into paid public entertainment, yet working within legal policy and technical models that don't fundamentally give them rights. While live streaming poses challenges to automated content regulation, it is a tech challenge actively being tackled. In the meantime, manual DMCA claims jump in, and as we've seen on platforms like YouTube, this has had profound effects on content distribution. So how are broadcasters navigating this legal thicket? With trepidation and confusion for the most part. Despite often having nuanced views themselves on what creative cultural production actually looks like, they face tremendous precarity. Some do their best to explicitly strive towards transformative work status, and in fact, if you go to TwitchCon, Twitch now tries to host panels telling people they need to strive for this transformative work threshold. Some also bank on building something so strong a company wouldn't dare mess with it. This is a fairly old quote, but I still find it interesting. As longtime popular broadcaster Day9 once put it, so I mean, let's say in five years, there's something like 15 million people watching the Day9 Daily every night. Let's just say that's the circumstance. And then Blizzard, a game company, realizes this and says, well, hey, we want to do a daily talk show on StarCraft too. We don't want some nerd doing it. And they tried to cut me out. Then all of a sudden, there's going to be these 15 million people saying, you took our entertainment away. This is one hope. The other major line you hear from casters is that game companies just see this as great PR for their games. And so that's why they let it continue. Watching streams can get people excited about games, bring them to the scene and culture, can help them find new games to buy. This is a little bit the cultural intermediaries argument. And this is all absolutely true. <coughs> all this is well and good, but I'm enough of a critical cultural pessimist to want to keep these regulatory structures on our radar. Being able to say things that critique games, maybe even piss off developers, is crucial. Ultimately, marketing and PR is an insufficient model for creative production of live streamers and a rich understanding of culture more broadly. Broadcasters themselves are nuanced. The arguments they regularly make about their productions represent a powerful form of vernacular legal frameworks, ones which at their heart present a much more expansive rendering of creative action and production with commercial products. As one put it, what is it that keeps people watching my cast is it me as a person, or is it just that I'm playing the games they want to see? I definitely think it's a mixture of both. I really do believe you can watch two different people broadcast the same game and have totally different experiences and totally different stories. The desire of many live streamers to profit from their work, to live within what are admittedly turbulent commercial systems built on platforms they don't own, must be better reckoned with. 
It cannot be simply be written off as co-opted fandom or exploitation, nor tolerated monetization at the discretion of real IP holders. The activities of players, which might otherwise be understood as simply enacting a game as given, can be a form of productive, creative engagement and transformative work, warranting much more cultural recognition and legal protection than they're currently afforded. This gap between how they experience their work and creative outputs and the legal structures that in turn regulate them is worth lingering on. Perhaps one of the most interesting threads in recent legal scholarship has been a turn toward the empirical along with the role of what's called vernacular law. Much in the same way that Jean Burgess's helpful concept of vernacular creativity captures the ways that everyday creative practices are important and can thrive outside high culture or commercialized paths, legal scholars have, are, have sought to understand how creative professionals actually think about their processes and the meanings around ownership in their daily lives. While there's a powerful myth surrounding the necessity of avidly protecting intellectual property to main, maintain, quote, monetary incentives and wealth maximization, as legal scholar Jessica Silby documents through her interviews with various kinds of creators, Intellectual property holds, as she puts it, diverse functions and sporadic manifestations in the lives and work of artists, scientists, their business partners, and managers. Her story is one in which people who are commonly accorded intellectual property rights actually have a more nuanced understanding than the law does of the function and role of, of IP and its relation to creative activity. Tushnet's similar, similar examination of the ability of specific creative communities to sensibly evaluate fair use claims also speaks to the thoughtfulness that producers bring to the issue. As she argues, quote, while copyright owners' interests must not be ignored, the wholesale commercial copying is extremely unlikely to constitute fair use. Creative communities recognize these principles and are capable of respecting copyright's legitimate scope while preserving space for transformation. This is resonant with the flip side claims that user producers such as live streamers make when reflecting on their formal legal versus experiential standing. While often stating that they have no meaningful legal protections or rights, they simultaneously talk about a profound feeling that they have real stakes as creative producers, ones that should be acknowledged and formally recognized. I'll just say this was not dissimilar to me as when in the old days you used to hear people, MMO players, talking about how they felt they had a right to sell their accounts, but they knew legally they didn't have the standing to do so. But their investment in time seemed to be under-recognized by the law. The broadcasters I've spoken with over the years actually understand that the rhetoric around intellectual property does not line up with everyday practices and does a disservice to the complexities of cultural production. A much broader range of actors and frequently in much messier ways than contemporary regulatory regi regimes acknowledge produce innovation, cultura cultural activity, and transformative works. Legal scholars Burns Weston and David Bollier maintain that vernacular law, the rules and forms of moral legitimacy, as well as the authority that can arise socially within everyday life, can offer a, can offer a powerful, quote, corrective to formal organized legal systems, unquote, that may be deemed unjust, unresponsive, or dysfunctional. Communication scholar Olivia Conti, in exploring the emergence of UGC, Celeste suggests that, quote, YouTube and other UGC platforms represent a fraught layer of mediation between institutional and vernacular, unquote. These everyday conversations, along with the lay theorizing around property claims and moral rights, or the desire for monetization by user producers can be found in common threads, subreddits, and ethnographic fieldwork. They consistently point to a more complex understanding of cultural production than we typically find constituted in the law. While claims about fair use offer, quote, the assertion of creator agency against unfair copyright law, vernacular discourse represents the assertion of localized community within a world dominated by institutional discourses, unquote. The arguments that live streamers regularly make about their productions represents a powerful form of vernacular interventions on legal frameworks. Ones at their heart, ones that at their heart present a much more expansive rendering of creative action and production with cultural products. They highlight a deeply co-creative model of culture 
echoing legal scholar Rosemary Coombs' understanding that the, quote, use of commercial media to make meaning is often a constitutive and transformative activity, not merely a referential or descriptive one, unquote. As a company, Twitch certainly recognizes the protective power that the designation of transformative work holds for broadcasters' content. As I mentioned at their annual Twitch convention, they sometimes host panels on intellectual property and transformative work. And I've heard staff members encourage streamers to think about the transformative aspects, think about transformative aspects they can add to their shows. Broadcasters are encouraged to become educated about what's legally permitted, which is actually no small feat, given the overall legal limbo in which, of, in which much of this content creation lingers. In fact, it's often very hard to get a straight answer from Twitch whether or not live streaming is actually permitted under current IP law. <laughs> Plaintively, uh, plainly, the company's interests are in broadcasters not running afoul of game developers or publishers, and it strives to have streamers engage in good faith practices. That said, as a company, it does not offer legal representation to streamers and situates them as independent producers who are encouraged to be educated about issues and ultimately solely responsible for what they produce. One of the themes I pick up on in the book, I won't say talk about here, is, is really thinking about the work of live streaming within larger conversations about precarious labor and the gig economy that we see all throughout um, our current moment. As I was in the final stages of preparing for my book, I learned that the company had, in partnership with the California Lawyers for the Arts and Legal IO, a legal services platform, launched a new site to assist streamers with a variety of issues. It offers a number of guides from licenses with Creative Commons to fair use in DMCA. Users can find attorneys through the site and get more info about creating limited liability companies or trademarks. On the one hand, it's great to see such resources being offered to broadcasters who are frequently desperate for help on guide and guidance. On the other, as legal scholar Jamie Woodcock more critically remarked to me, this type of setup has been the way the gig economy platforms have sidestepped meaningful accountability to their workers at large. And as you may imagine, on the heels of the California Prop 5, I think that was, just went through on trying to credit people for work, there's really interesting issues that are now um, you know, it's, it's around mostly Uber and Lyft, if you're counted as an employee, but there's this kind of interesting side conversation about how live streaming might be affected. Though these companies rest on the labor of non-employees, they expect them to function as independent operators who bear all the risk. Given how much the playing field is tipped against smaller content creators with our current intellectual property regimes, and how much precarity overall streamers face, I'm concerned about that position the position it puts many of them in. The desire of many live streamers to profit from their work, to live within what are admittedly turbulent commercial systems built on platforms they don't own must be better reckoned with. Such desires can't be simply written off as co-opted fandom or exploitation, or simply tolerated monetization at the discretion of these intellectual property holders. The activities of players, which might otherwise be understood as simply enacting the game as given, has to be seen in a different way. Finally, we might also think about linking up our inquiries into live streaming and with, and to even broader issues about the nature of play in digital environments. Game studies scholarship has long revealed a much more sophisticated model of computation and creative human action, of the circuit between humans, machines, and others than most law and social theory currently captures. This is a much more nuanced co-creative model with machines, with games as artifacts, with even game developers. It's a model of play as performance and as cultural work. And I believe if we turn back to this fundamental that play is at its heart transformative, we might not want to seed ground so quickly. If you want to take live streaming seriously as a medium and a new form of cultural production, if we want to have, a richer, if we want to have richer understandings of the work of play, we need something more than models, models rooted in marketing or PR. We have to start thinking about the way live streaming is a new form of media that exceeds the bounds of game artifacts, of narrow IP formulations, and stands as or has the potential to a critical cultural space. And while they wouldn't probably want to make the link themselves, I want to suggest that the transformative work gamers do is part of a much longer critical conversation about media ownership and creation. 
Live streamers are, in a very real sense, following the old DIY call, don't just watch TV, make it. And if folks were around, remember the fights over public access cable television and the early moves to get people producing television broadcast film content for each other. The provocative twist is that they may not have this explicit political orientation, though I'd say their actions are deeply political. And in fact, live streamers may even want to profit from their work in the space. Though their practices are, through their practices, they are pushing entirely new notions of networked broadcast and creation in digital culture. They're participating in a much longer and important conversation about access to media production and distribution as part of a democratic society. I would argue that turning our attention to those larger stakes actually offers us better footholds to tackle many important issues I've not been able to discuss here today, um, but that are crucial for us to pay attention to. There are serious participation gaps in this space of live streaming. Ongoing harassment, sexism, racism, homophobia. There are important issues around labor and ep economic precarity, ones that resonate, as I said, with broader conversations I think we're having about the gig economy and contract labor. But what I want to argue is that by taking live streaming seriously as a place of not only play, but labor and cultural production, we hopefully will be more focused and energized to solve some of those other pressing questions. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. Comments, questions? Thank you, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I had a question about Twitch as a corporation and as a distribution platform. Yep. Because of um, your analogy to television, the way that network television you know, uh, functions historically in terms of power is that the networks themselves as the distributors yeah. had so much power and found ways to monetize everything that they were doing in ways that allowed them to control the entire industry. Yeah. So I'm wondering about, um, like how Twitch functions as a corporation, how they make money, how they monetize the live streams, and um, if there's any kind of competition for them. I mean, there's YouTube, right? But that YouTube is already monetizing these things too. So where, like, is there any space for that, the distribution, because distribution has historically been the, the space where media corporations control access and make money. Yeah, so uh, the two parts I'll answer you. So, uh, Twitch makes money, it's largely advertising driven, um, but they also cut sponsorship deals and enter into arrangements, especially around esports. Um, they're interesting though because they're doing the dance that a lot of social media companies are doing, which is, you know, kind of talking about being a platform that lots of stuff gets broadcast on, and if they're a platform, maybe they shouldn't be curating. On the other hand, they do do curation. So they kind of uh, position themselves in this, in this dual way. You know, come here and stream, um, but there's some curation taking place. And there was recently, actually this last week, the head of Twitch gave an interview and was trying to position the platform even slightly differently from YouTube saying, we're not a free speech platform, we actually do have guidelines and not everybody can do everything here. So they're trying to kind of, I don't wanna say game both sides, but they're trying to balance off both of these sides. They do have competition. So far, they have not had serious competition, but Microsoft runs a platform called Mixer, and Microsoft cut a very big deal. We don't know the actual amount. It would be in the millions of dollars, we think, with a very high-profile broadcaster who now only streams on Mixer. Um, and there's several other now competing platforms. And in fact, when you look globally, um, so Twitch doesn't do particularly well in places like China. China has several massive, massive live streaming sites that are owned by the corporate entities there. So um, I'm kind of giving multiple answers. So I think you know part of what they have been the site predominantly thus far, but they're starting to be more competition. But I do think they are trying to thread this weird needle on we are just a distributor versus we are actually doing content creation and production. And I would just flag if people haven't read it yet, Charlton Gillespie's book, um, Custodians, Guardians, of the internet, custodians, thank you, is a really great um, examination of that kind of neutral platform stance, 
companies are trying to kind of dance around and yet still reckoning with the governance that they have to undertake. So it's a really, it's an important question though. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that you were talking to the broadcasters. Did you also talk to their audiences to see who they were and how they were making sense of all of this? Yeah, I don't do so much with audiences. Um, I've over the years, I have, there's a very short bit in the book on kind of why people watch, which has, I've gotten just mostly from, I don't know, more, I, want to say, I was gonna say like ambient research. It hasn't been as directed, but no, I, I really, I was very interested in thinking about the work that was being undertaken in different sectors of gaming to produce this stuff, so I didn't. But you could, of course, think about the work audiences themselves are engaged in. Mm -hmm. um, the other place that audiences come into play in the, in the story I tell in the book is around esports, because audiences become um, a site of production. So putting cameras on audiences and getting cameras to cheer. So the fact that esports now takes place in massive stadiums is as much needed for the production. So right, if we have a lot of cameras around and we show the stadium filled with people, so the way audiences get deployed as parts of the performance is, is but, but I didn't spend a lot of time talking to the audience. I was, I was at the specific question. Yeah. I was at the Blizzard Arena this past March for yeah. a stage playoff at the Overwatch League yeah. and went there with my son. And it was exactly this. Yeah. It's a relatively small arena that they've done there for, they did there for some years. Yeah. And we walked in and we were like, well, let's go up there and sit up, you know, where we're going to, no, you weren't allowed to sit up above you. Yeah, they, everyone was seated down where the cameras yeah. would have you yeah. in view. Yeah, right? and, they, and they, it's not unusual now if you go to esports events, they will have materials, to, they will give you materials to make signs, yeah. they will give you thunder sticks. So they, they, your fandom is a part of the production and, and deploying that fandom. Um, and also, again, one of the chapters in the book is on, is on esports, but audiences are crucial to, um, uh, the way revenue is generated too. So the conceptualization of audience and revenue mod um, audience models for revenue generation is really important. I want to shout back at you too. Also, I think you're you're underselling your treatment of why people watch in the book. Oh, I mean, okay. you've got a four part model. For I do. I mean, I can put. A, I I always ha I always have the. This is this is why. This is my yeah. Why I think this is why yeah. Thanks thanks, Dory. Yeah. So I mean, I have a passage there. Um, some of these are probably pretty obvious. Um, the one I love, I love shouting out because it's to me so resonant. I was saying this at lunch today is the ambient sociality. Increasingly, people have streams on in the background, um, and they are just a kind of co-presence. The other thing there is somebody. There's a great project waiting to be done. One of the emergent things I'm certainly seeing is people. It's not unusual now for people to watch a live stream of a game and not go buy the game. And right now the system is predicated on the idea that it is good marketing. <laughs> and I think all we need is a little bit of data <laughs> um, to show that that is a very precarious hypothesis. <laughs> and that's an interesting, I don't know that we have a good, um, I, don't I don't know that we have good conceptualization about how watching a game satisfies the itch of playing the game. Mm -hmm. I think we've kind of overblown what the active hands on the controller has been in game studies. That's been kind of the fetish spot. Um, but the spectating, the watching alongside, the being satisfied by watching somebody else play, that's been under theorized. Yeah. Um, so my question uh, is a little bit, I guess, off topic, but yeah. still um, like on that interview that yeah. you had just mentioned yeah. because of the ways that uh, currently like free speech has kind of been brought into like with white supremacy yeah. and also with the like so on twitch there was a live stream of like a yeah. shooting yeah. that happened yeah. um and then also kind of like with the the stuff going on in hong kong right now and that like so like was f do you think free speech meant something else there yeah i guess is my yeah no like, i think i think this is the other side of that coin so i you know i'm i'm kind of in a talk I can't quite give you, hopefully I have a more balanced take on it in the book, you see, but I, I want to kind of do, try to do two moves here. One is kind of, I do want to argue for a framework that protects streamers, but as I, sp I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the forms of harassment and toxicity and all of the ways in which really lousy things simultaneously happen on the platform. And I think, again, part of what's happened on a lot of social media platforms is they kind of want to put up this space 
and then they don't do a whole lot to regulate it. They don't do a whole lot to help people moderate. They don't, I mean, Twitch is a little bit better than some, um, but, but there's this kind of real dual spot they hold. And um, I will say I'm a huge plan, fan of deplatforming. I think that's a completely legit strategy. Uh, I don't know if you saw, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos was deplatformed and he's been complaining about being broke since. And, I am like, thank God. So, <laughs> so I kind of am wanting to hold two things in hand at the same time. But yeah, I don't know if that quite gets at your. Did you turn it on? Sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm very interested in, uh, in the power inter interplay between like many the many stakeholders that uh, mm -hmm. comes into play here. Uh, specifically between like the power that Twitch holds as a platform and also how this power flows through game developers as well and also particular streamers. For example, you're talking about Microsoft Mixer. Yeah. And I'm, I, it, what comes in my mind is like when, when you become like such a huge deal of a streamer that you are able to like cut a deal to like be exclusive to one platform yeah. and also like uh, so that's one point and the other point is like do, do you see how game developers are being like impacted by this streaming culture as well like how uh, being streamable is like yeah. should they maybe important to like uh, a commercial development development of games yeah. Uh, so uh, I want to know what your take on this. So I, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but I, I, some of you may have caught it. So this, I, I discussed this case in, in some detail in the book um, because I think it highlights the first point you're making, which is there are multiple and competing stakeholders. I've just now kind of talked about, you know, there's the, the live streamers and then there's game companies. But the, the spectate faker incident was really instructive because basically what happened was the game client allowed you to spectate anybody's game. You could go in and watch. So the game, so the, the, the system facilitated that. Somebody who loved this very popular pro, pro player, faker, every time faker played, they would take that feed and pipe it to Twitch. Okay. So what happened? Faker was contracted to a team. That team was in a league that was contracted to a competing broadcasting platform. So the competing broadcasting platform, Azubu, sent a DMCA takedown request to the guy who was just piping out video from the game client, saying, you can't do that. Well, the guy said, well, why do you say you own that to tell me I can't do that? Doesn't Riot own that? Doesn't Faker own that? And there was literally, I recounted the book, there was a good week where you, everybody was trying to, there was a skirmish. Who, who owns the rights to taking that down? Is it the third party competing side? Is it the team that Faker is contracted to? It is the game and there was a week of back and forth and in the end, Riot, the game company, said that they owned the rights. So the DMCA claim was false should have come from Riot, but nonetheless. And it exactly points, to me, it highlights, it is the given, these are complex assemblage multi-actor systems. And we do a disservice to them conceptually to sort of imagine like, it's a game, it's a player, and there's a game company. Actually, game culture is woven through with that assemblage. And until we both methodolo methodologically and conceptually get our heads around that, we only end up telling half the story. So to me, this is, and this has been an ongoing, when I, when I wrote my eSports book, it was very interesting to talk to eSports players and say, who owns your action? Who owns the game action that you produce in a game? I will tell you, professional players are like, I own it. That's me. <laughs> that is my virtuosic human action. And law does not kind of account for that. So that was the first one. Your second question about, oh yeah, game developers having to now confront streaming as a thing. Absolutely, and, 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 it, and different ones are approaching it different ways. There's some game developers who are like, we are gonna make games that are fundamentally premised on the idea that they are streamable, and maybe even they require audience interaction. There are other developers who have actually had bans on streaming their game, because often they're like story games and they don't want, they don't want the story ruined. Um, others buy into the cultural intermediaries. 
So I think they're all trying to figure it out. And I think they're all, they're also, I think, especially some of them are trying to balance, is there revenue there? So I think, it, especially in the esports space, you know, game companies used to not care about esports. When I did my esports book, that esports was built on commun grassroots communities and third party companies. Now that there's audiences, and this is just an old media study saying there are audiences, they're monetizable, they get broken up, their views get counted, game companies care. So this is the other thing, is game companies actually going like, oh wait, is there revenue we're leaving on the table? And, and how do we leverage this into, into that? So no single answer. <laughs> So uh, we talked about a little bit about like the Twitch gu guidelines for partners and streamers. Yeah. You know, last month uh, one of the streamers, Amaranth, was banned for three days mm -hmm. because of a uh, sexual suggestive content. Mm -hmm. And there's something that the the Turkish streamers discuss a lot about how obscenity placed in placed in the Twitch and how Twitch controls that yeah. and how. And they negotiate this, like what is obscene, what is not. And we see that also like in the in the US history with the First Amendment, mm -hmm. like how obscenity is placed. And yeah. we actually don't even have like a one particular definition of obscenity in the yeah. United States by law. Mm -hmm. And like do you see any instances that people discuss that uh the sexual suggestive content or even maybe pornographic yeah. content is like a, is a rivalry content because yeah. Uh, some of the you know uh, streamers in Turkey, for example, actually waiting for a new platform to show up and just like get away mm. from this like, Interesting. like yeah. pornographic turning site, which actually actually is like I'm also wondering like yeah. how it's gonna shape and yeah. turn into something. Yeah, I mean, I would say the conversation is people are talking about this all the time within Twitch communities, and it has been from the beginning. I mean, in the book, I I go back and I have I had I there are these amazing moments in the early Twitch forum days when Twitch was running their own forum where people would be like, "Is it okay?" So one of my favorites, I was turning to you because one of my favorites was somebody way back in the day said, "Like, can you stream Second Life?" Because sometimes, you know, you might end up in a zone where there's like adult content. And the answer was, actually, you probably shouldn't because it's not quite safe. So it was really, the, the, the platform has itself been weirdly, cautiously, complexly, contradictorily navigating that. Um, and communities themselves are always debating it. I will say that the banning thing, I think what many of us are frustrated by is, for example, there's a fantastic... A uh, game designer who does terrific kind of queer games, uh, Robert Yang, and his games are not allowed on Twitch because they are seen as too adult and too explicit. So those games, there's a whole category of games that are not allowed and his are one of them. Um, but at the same time, the platform does not enforce its own policies on racism all the time. They had a very high profile streamer who was up for the three strikes and you're out policy on uh, racist speech and they didn't get rid of him. So I think for many people, it's like, we can all be talking about this, but if the platform itself is not following its own rules when it comes to high profile streamers, which means more ad revenue, right? Um, that there's, there's a really kind of fundamental problem there. And also this thing about what would it look like to actually build a platform that allows like Robert Yang's games on, uh, games on them, but so sort of kind of can acknowledge complex different audiences, maybe older audiences. Um, but that that just hasn't hasn't happened. But lots of con I would say lots of conversation. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, first, thank you. This whole thing was very great. Um, okay, so my question kind of goes to your idea for a fair framework. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And my unrealistic idea. I know, and I want to know more about it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it is possible, even if it's really hard to uh -huh. achieve. Yeah. Um, but given this like professionalization and the kind of additional complexities that are coming up as a result of teams professionalizing and leagues coming together, mm -hmm. I wonder how do you see a way for us to achieve that fair framework and kind of balance these individual streamers that do still want to monetize and kind of have their own version yeah. of a professional stream? as opposed to other streamers that are either like ex esports players and still working for an organization. Yeah. yeah. So 
part of so with this book there were two audiences I I really wanted I really wanted them to read it and be engaged. One was like media scholars because as I said I've said to some people earlier like I don't think media studies scholars pay enough, enough attention to games. It's it's kind of absurd how little attention they really pay. The other was legal scholars. So this whole stuff about transformative work was me trying to find like hooks into a way to reconceptualize because I think my vision of intellectual property law is way more radical than what we're going to see any time in the near future. But if we could just start building in some hooks to uh, reconceptualizing this as transformative work, maybe we could get there. So I, I mean, I don't know how possible that all is. I mean, the esports stuff is, so you know, you, can ha you have the live streamers and the intellectual property case there. Esports has its own, as I was mentioning with the spectate faker uh, uh, issue is esports has its own complex relationship with intellectual property because again game companies tend to want to say that they own the playing field and and again those of us in on university campuses should be really pausing at this because as esports is coming onto campuses you know these are commercial playing fields where developers then can roll up the playing field and take it home <laughs> you know they can say you're not allowed. In fact, and I don't know if you're following this, you know, there have been, in the same way the NBA has been having stuff happening around Hong Kong protests, it's been happening in games as well. So there have been people who have spoken out about Hong Kong and support of the Hong Kong protesters in games, esports players who were then banned. And there was just recently on university campus two or three players who held up a sign in support of Hong Kong, and Blizzard just enacted a six month ban on them. So we have to be really, we have to be thinking about what the implications are for these commercial fields in our, on our college campuses. And in fact, one of the cases I recount in my esports book is when there was a skirmish between the organizing body in South Korea around esports and Blizzard. Esports used to be, esports really grew heavily in South Korea. There was a huge governing body that made it happen. And they got in a fight with Blizzard because Blizzard said, what are you talking about? We own we own the game, and the governing body said, what are you talking about? There's no esports without us. <laughs> like, we run the leagues, we run the tournaments, we cut the deal. Like, what is this idea? You get to own it all. So that's a huge fish to fry. Um, and, you know, they all kind of play nice, and then there are these, I love those critical case moments, and there are these, ga these ruptures that happen, and it really illuminates the stakes that are there. So... <coughs> I don't know, that was an unsatisfying answer. You're, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I just keep trying to push, push this point, but I think it's, we, we, do, we do not live in this, the moment that I'm envisioning and hoping for with IP, we don't live in it. So I sort of feel like that's the luxury of being academic. I can keep pushing the radical IP <laughs> argument. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um. Well, thanks for super interesting talk. So um, I do media theory and media studies. So, you know, I'm interested. It's a kind of, it'll be a rambly kind of question because um, I don't think I've fully formed it. But a couple of things I guess I'm to just, I wanted to say. First, I really liked your model at the beginning about mm -hmm. the interaction between internet, television, mm -hmm. I forget the mm -hmm. third one. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in thinking about that in relation to media history and the kind of like the different, the transformations yeah. uh, of mediation that go on. Mm -hmm. um, when I want to talk in my writing about, when I want to use a phrase that covers all media, I've been lately saying print, televisual, and networked media. Oh, and you have, nice. <laughs> And you have televisual and networked, but print yeah, I don't have isn't part yeah. of it. So then to the next sort of part of this question, which may or may not be related, okay. I'm really interested then in the screen, the sort of formal features of the streaming screen yeah. in a way that is obviously part of Twitch, but that's much broader than Twitch. It's really video streaming in general. Yeah. So again, if you think about a move from a kind of transparent televisual mm -hmm or cinematic screen that we used to have where you would look right through it 
to then the kind of hypermediated, fragmented screen, screen of TV news now with the mm -hmm. yeah. Chirons on the bottom right. and so forth with all the boxes. Yeah. Now, it, if in fact, as you were saying at the beginning, there's this kind of shift to this new mm -hmm. networked yeah. broadcasting yeah. model, yeah. there's also perhaps, I guess I'm interested in the relationship between that shift and the shift to a certain formal arrangement of the screen mm -hmm where you've got text running constantly down the right side. Because you see this on, when you see somebody do Facebook Live, for example, um, if in pornography there's a site Chatterbait, uh, yeah. and, and that's very... Chatterbait looks a lot like, like Twitch. Like twi Twitch, exactly. It, no, really, it's no, kind of remarkable. Absolutely. The first time, yeah, I presented Abs on, and people were like, that's like Chatterbait. I was like, what are you What I wanted about? to know, and what I was wondering about Twitch is whether there's any monetary element to that, because Chatterbait's clearly about, yeah. you know, about profit. Um, and so, yeah. I don't know, it's just, so, so I don't have a, yeah, no, it's, it's not exactly a question, but I'm really interested in thinking about what, what it means for us to have gone to a screen that is divided between, on the one hand, this live, immediate, transparent video image, mm -hmm used even in like killings and, you know, I mean like these mass murderers who have tried to stream their stuff yeah. on Twitch. So this, this real impulse for liveness, immediacy, and then this, this streaming thing, which it's not print, but it is text. No, it's a so great, what is it yeah, about that relation? Yeah. I just don't know. I don't have an answer, no, but yeah. I, that's what I've sort of been yeah. mulling over in your talk. So I, I like, I mean, I, I like your comment because, well, one is, one of the things I try to do in the book is make is is gesture to the com like live streaming doesn't come out of nowhere. So you even have I mean there's been interactive television for decades. I often failed weird attempts. So I see this as sitting as part of that history as well. Just really, really quickly, yeah. Leia and I had the great luck of meeting yeah. a group of D and D players. Have been You're going to talk. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> great luck of meeting a group. Sorry. Yeah, it's all about media. Sorry. Um, uh, great luck of meeting a set of D&D &D players who have been playing forever near Lake Geneva. Yeah. And one of the members of that group was using public access television to live stream D&D &D with a phone running one of the characters, okay. right? People okay. would call in yeah. to play one of the yeah. no, exactly, exactly what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. There are these histories that are already threaded through there. In 1975. Yeah, 1975. Yeah, no, exactly. yeah way back yeah. then. Yeah. No, exactly. The other thing that I think is interesting about the point you're making about print, because you're right, it's not, it's not, I have to admit, it's not something my eye usually turns to, but I will tell you, we can construct all kinds of theories about the Twitch screen, but if you go to China, they, their aesthetic convention is they have something called bullet chat. The chat flows straight across the screen in a constant layer of conversation. So over the, over the yeah. So again, I mean, this is the sort of maybe this is the ethnographer. The scope side of me is like, we should be cautious about creating media theory writ large based on the Twitch screen because you can go to China and Japan and see very different sets of aesthetic conventions. And in fact, because I'm showing you static images too, what I'm not able to show you is on a Twitch screen how these things come and go in out of favor aesthetically. But there have certainly been times where Twitch broadcasters had a lot of graphic elements pop on screen and kind of wash out everything else that was happening. So, so anyway, that's, I love your comment and it's a long swing. I think there's probably more to be done on that text, print, whatever we're calling that yeah. node. Just one more yeah. follow-up to that. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, Tom Mitchell's done some really interesting work on image text and on iconology. And part of the argument there is that text is used, whether it's even just the, like a photograph with a title, the text constrains the meaning mm. of image. Mm. And I don't know if that's what's happening mm. here, but that would be another way to begin to investigate that in the work that's been done on the relationship between image and text mm. in yeah. media, various yeah. forms of yeah. media. Um, I'll make one other point about the potential sort of text site is, uh, one of the things I do discuss in the book is, and it's probably the un an under-theorized part of the book, but there is something about the affective use of aesthetics in Twitch chat that we, there's a lot, there's a lot more still to be said about that. But the way aesthetics and genre conventions tap into affective, 
engagement and work and presence. And, and there's, again, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of good topics <laughs> still out there to be, to be thought about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thanks uh, for an awesome talk, of course. And I wanted to. Well, I'm most interested in this topic of ambient sociality right. and the the gap between watching a game and whether or not you're actually you said scratching an itch of playing the game or really want to play the game at all. I guess you have a couple examples of this, but I want to know sort of like how, what is the volume of uh, of examples you've observed where. Uh, sociality is not ambient, but tips over into being the performance on offer from a streamer, and then the game uh, in the background is really an icebreaker, a red herring uh, for for socialization to occur. Uh, a lot of questions about that. Would that if you see examples of that, does that improve the position of a streamer? Because then you don't have all these contingencies of that the, the developer can sort of use against you because you're using their IP? Um, or would you see that, could you see that this kind of uh, social focus of streaming grow to the point where that is streaming and that video games are really just an origin myth? Mm. You know, and really what we have is an ocean of call-in talk shows that are broadcast from people's homes. Yeah. So I've never, I, I never predict the future. I have no idea what will happen. <laughs> so I'm going to dodge that one. Um, I mean, I think the thing about the, the, the sociality and that interaction mode, for variety streamers, it can be a really important skill. Because again, if you just think of the, the, the tons of people that are out there streaming, um, that connection with the audience is something that this, I, I don't know, this may change over time, but the people I was interviewing, the ones who are really trying to work at a professional level and earning an income at it, they had mastered this. Um, it was part of that circuit of engagement and recognizing audience. And again, I really do think there's some, it, not that all of them have to do it. So this is why I do think that if you haven't seen Nancy Bame's recent book, Playing to the Crowd, where she's trying to talk about given our social media moment. <laughs> um, the work musicians now have to do, not all of them do it, but the work many of them do to have to be in relation to audience. I think there's some kindredness there. So, um, but it's a very hard skill to master. I mean, it really, but the ones that do it, it, it really does seem to draw a lot of people back. It's, and it is very, you know, one of the, it was one of the most interesting conversation I would have with streamers is I would ask them how they understood their audience. Like, what do you call your audience? And it was really interesting. There was no single answer, of course. For some, they use language of family. For others, they use language of community. Um, but, you know, they all had to sort of face like, what does it mean when you have 15,000 people coming back to watch you day to day, and you know a lot of their names, and they're inviting you to weddings, and they're coming to you? Like, so that kind of community affective management is, is very complex. Yeah. All right, one last question. And then we have reception, so we can yeah. also. <laughs> um, so we've talked a lot about um, streaming as like labor, right? Um, affective labor, yeah. transformative labor. Yeah. Um, and a lot of us here are in this corner are the yeah. serious play people. So I'm wondering, how do you conceptualize potentially Twitch and streaming as academic labor, our site of academic labor? I, I tend to be on, of the mindset, like, uh, I believe whatever you call it is what I believe you experience it as. <laughs> so if you call it that, I, I believe you that that's your experience. And I think part of that gesture, part of me wanting to make that gesture about labor and work is I think, I, I think we sometimes, we just so misunderstand both categories. Like we often don't understand play is incredibly workful, grindy, frustrating, painful. Um, I mean, even in my MMO book, I tried, to in, I tried to intervene and say like fun isn't the right term. Um, and of course, similarly, like, not every, for those of us who are perhaps lucky, there are moments when work is playful, pleasurable, it does, other, it does other things, or you get social connect, even if you're in a shitty job, you have some connection and fulfillment and so, like we, I just don't think we, we do a good job of describing either of those. So anyway, if you all say, it feels like labor, it's a form of, 
I'm, hey, Stuart's really, <laughs> uh, when, okay, but let me say, you can feel that, and I, and I validate that feeling, that is separate from whether or not it travels in the world as recognized labor. Right, yeah, so, so and, and in part, part of what my book is trying to do is both validate people's experience of it as labor and make an argument so that it can travel and be understood that way. So that's, I think, the, that's the challenge is, is it may not look to the others like that. And that's, <laughs> then you gotta be pragmatic sometimes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.